love Halloween. I love a good scare. I like I, li I like all the ghosties and all the fun stories. Um, but we do live in times where things are genuinely scary. And so I think as we're thinking about this week, we need to think about, you know, when we think about the root of the things that are scary, they're really about dehumanization, right? They're really about not seeing other. And it's not seeing other when it comes to voters. It's not seeing others when it comes to people that are different from us. And as we look at thinking about money and politics, usually we're not talking about, well, that's about dehumanization. But of course, we know that corporations are intricately entwined in the story of money and politics. And so I'm going to start off with a fun story, since we took a moment just to, to think about the sadness and the scariness, and let's face it, the horrors of money and politics. OK, so does anyone in here know who Mark Hanna is? OK. Oh, yes. Who's Mark Hanna? Um, I think he was a, um, um, a, a publisher of a newspaper. He was a U.S. senator, and he was the Karl Rove of a gentleman who, his name is on the road that goes by us, William Howard Taft. So he, he was a senator. He was actually up from, Cle from Cleveland. Hannah, this is interesting, um, Hannah said this about money and politics. There are three things that are important about money and politics. The first is money. And I don't remember the rest of them. <laughs> and so as we think about well, as we think about the tale of money and politics, was we think about the just the saddest tales about how the needs of people are not met because of money and politics, we need to remember that this is a really long story. Um, and what we do know is that, th that for many years, um, go going back to George Washington being worried about um, the influence of money in politics, that it's a long story. So for many of us, we, you know, you start you know, think about Citizens United or, you know, there are different things that we talk about, but it's a long story. And you'll notice I included some older cartoons that included Boss Tweed. Now, Boss Tweed was like, he was basically ran the Democratic machine there in New York City. Um, and of course, he was raking in the cash and it was influencing public policy. I thought that was especially important as you're thinking about making a change here in Cincinnati to make your elections more robust by establishing guardrails. Because when we think about what are the rules about money and politics, they're to establish guardrails. Because you know what we need to do is rein in corruption as much as possible. So um, when we think about the first time that um, a president and a Congress stepped in to address money and politics, I bet Bill knows this answer. How long ago was that bill? More than a hundred years ago. It was under Teddy. Ro it was under Teddy Roosevelt. And when we think about you know, think about the Gilded Age, and you start to think about just, you know, that was a time period where, you know, you think about the journalism that was coming out, um, just Standard Oil and all of these corporations really taking advantage of workers. Um, you, if you think about just the, the, the notion at that point, it was really clear, it was really clear that there was a horror of money in politics, and that the voters needed and deserved much better. And so Teddy Roosevelt um, promoted and the Congress passed rules saying that corporations could not give to federal candidates. And states like Ohio followed. So, uh, is, oh, yeah. what were you gonna say, Bill? Okay, states like Ohio followed. And so we do have a rule that says corporations are not permitted to give directly to candidates. <laughs> now, as you know, when it comes to the rules of money and politics, over time, there's been a whittling away at the rights of people. And some of this goes back to, if we, if we look at 1976, um, there was a Supreme Court decision. Um, it's called Buckley versus Vallejo, um, where the Supreme Court said, money isn't speech, but it is the gas that makes the cargo. And so you need the money to get yourself to the debate. You need the money for the yard sign. You need the money for the TV ads. Um, and the, they, at that point, they said, we cannot restrict how much is actually spent. We can have campaign contribution limits to root out quid pro quo, but we can't restrict how much they spend. And as you can imagine, if you can't restrict how much they spend, 
but you do restrict, restrict how much people can give, they're going to look for all sorts of ways, all sorts of ways around the rules, right? And that's absolutely exactly what happened. As you remember, it's all of a sudden there's soft money. And so as we think about kind of the history of the problems, we should be thinking about what it meant to public policy. And now I'll just take Ohio, for example. Um, we have bailed out First Energy as a utility, AEP, a number of different times where we bailed them out when they run into problems. And that has real consequences for all of us. And so if you look at your utility bills, you can actually see that we are helping to basically <laughs> bail these folks out. And then they actually have now again asked for another bailout from the taxpayers saying that they, they can't be sustainable and they can't meet some, some goals about making sure that we can breathe better. And these are very real consequences that we are actually, we actually face. When you think about, Mr. Rooney, you said what percentage don't actually pay any taxes? 37%. 37%. That has real consequences for the city of Cincinnati. And so when we think about money in politics, we need to be thinking about, it is horrifying. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of fun for me to wear a hat. It's kind of fun. But it is genuinely horrifying to think about how this influences us all. So for many of us, we're really familiar with, the, with Citizens United. Folks that come to these things, you, you all know probably more about money in politics than I do. But as we think about what happened, oh, there's our friend Boss Queen. Um, uh, um, and as we think about, as we think about kind of <coughs> the things that happened with Citizens United. So first you have you have the Supreme Court saying, you know, 1976, hey, um, it isn't speech, but it's somewhat equivalent to speech. You know, money becomes equivalent to speech if it's about making the car go, right? Um, by the time we get to 2010. <coughs> The U.S. Supreme Court says that corporations have been forbidden for too long. We have squashed the First Amendment rights of corporations for too long. And then, in fact, we need to have more speech and corporations should have more ability to communicate. Do you think there was anyone in 2010 that didn't know what corporations wanted? Didn't, you know, didn't hear from them, didn't understand what they wanted? And what we know, the consequence of that Turn your television on. I mean, it's astonishing. Yes, you're going to see some ads from candidates, but there are ad after ad <laughs> after ad that is from dark money. Because we didn't actually do the updating that we need to do in the state of Ohio and in the country so that we could actually determine who was paying for these ads. And in fact, one of the things I discovered last week as, um, as we looked, at the, uh, basically the campaign finance deadline came along and I was like, oh, this is interesting. What's, what's in this report? And what I discovered is that the affiliate for the Chamber of Commerce that does a bunch of their advertisements actually changed their name this cycle. And so that's the other thing is trying to keep up to understand who's actually funding these. And we can say, oh, the Chamber of Commerce, we know what they want basically. And yet we don't know who gave to do the advertisements. And it's hard to hold people accountable if you don't know who speaks. Now when we think about, there's just a bunch of different ways to think about free speech. <laughs> We're here in, an, in, in a situation where we could all have an opportunity to speak. There'll be an opportunity for questions. But you know what, Bill's going to rein it in at some point. Like if I just keep talking, he's going to say, you know, Catherine, we're going to rein this in. And, and that's not squashing free speech. If this were a town hall and all of us got in line to say our three minutes, let's say, you do a short thing that you wanted to say to city council or to the Ohio Senate or wherever it is you're giving your testimony, and we would not be surprised at all if we had time with this. And yet, we should have no problem whatsoever with anybody sending unlimited amounts of money. That does not actually make any sense. We have mechanisms for finding ways to have <coughs> debates and good communication, but when it comes to money and politics, it's just a crazy free-for-all. And sometimes you get this thing. How many of you heard this one? Well, we can't really rein that in because then they'll just find ways around it. Have y'all heard that one? Yeah, we just can't, there's just nothing, there's just nothing we can do because of course they're gonna find ways around it. 
<coughs> you know what? I'm really glad that they're not, you know, they're not saying, oh, you know, people are murdering people. And you know what? We really need to stop that because people are finding ways around it. Right? I mean, it's like it's a ridiculous note. It's a ridiculous notion to say, hey, um, we, the rules are bad because people are violating it. The rules are, if the rules weren't there, then they wouldn't be violating, they wouldn't be violating it, but it would be a complete and total free-for-all. And that's actually what we have right now. And so, as we think about campaign funding limits, the devil is in the details. When you talked about your Proposition 13, the devil is in the details. If you don't get all those details right, then it becomes really difficult to rein it in. And money in politics is something that we need to think about as an ongoing battle. <laughs> This is an ongoing, the big bad, this overwhelming amount of money, the scary monster that is this enormous amount of money. It's a long-term battle. And do I have any friends for Move to Amend here? All right. So for my Move to Amend friends, we need to be thinking, first of all, thinking about things like, well, we need better disclosure when it comes to dark money. Because nobody should be able to operate in secret. We deserve to know who is doing political ads. I've been thinking a lot about like how do you um, influence the state legislature, understand this problem, and I really think it's judicial campaigns that we can make it, make it really clear. One, we're electing these judges, they're supposed to be independent, and in fact, there's advertisement that is spent that we cannot track the bit, we can't track it, and it's in judicial elections. It's supposed to be a different branch. This is completely problematic. But then when we think bigger about it, not having access to that information, not understanding who a speaker is when you see a political advertisement, one, it makes them act worse, right? How many of you have seen positive, rosy ads? I can think of one. There was one with Sherrod Brown and a dog, right? Like, I mean, like, there are very few positive ads. And a lot of that comes down to we don't necessarily know who the speaker is. And then, if you can spend unlimited amounts, then you do spend unlimited amounts. And it really corrupts the ability to have a, a conversation, a debate about what it is that we want from our candidates who will become our public officials. All right, so that's a, that's a part of it. But what I'm talking about, reining things in and curbing bad behavior, that doesn't get to any, that doesn't get to everything, right? Because at the end of the day, the US Supreme Court has basically said that corporations have First Amendment rights. That corporations